Welcome back. Today we'll be looking at a quintessential horror movie classic and another part of the John Carpenter Apocalypse trilogy, The Thing, which bizarrely was critically panned at the time of release. Also, a little known fact is that it's actually a remake of a black and white film called The Thing from Another World, which had elements of what we know as The Thing but without any of the paranoia as it was a single creature stalking and killing people. It was very of its time 1950s horror sci-fi fare. But what's more interesting is that both films are actually based on a novella by John W. Campbell Jr. called Who Goes There? And if you read the story, you'll find that The Thing sticks very, very close to its source material, taking whole scenes directly from the story. But there are a few differences as well. This is John Carpenter's The Thing. In a huge nod to its 1950s sci-fi roots, the film begins with a very stereotypical flying saucer crashing into Earth, which subtly lulls the audience into a false sense of security, because if you see a stereotypical flying saucer, you'd expect stereotypical aliens to emerge. Especially as this film was released just a few months after E.T. So, at this point, it's some clever misdirection. We then lead into the fantastic opening titles that nearly identically mirrors the original films and was actually achieved with a burning trash bag and a fish tank full of smoke as an amazing example of practical effects. However, after the titles is where the film becomes subtle as the music by Ennio Morricone begins. And to me, because we just saw a spaceship crash, it has another meaning. Let's listen. A heartbeat. Something survived the crash. But we don't see it. We just get the vague insinuation that something is alive. Probably because that when we do see it, we won't know what we're seeing. We're told it's Antarctica 1982, as a helicopter bearing the Norwegian markers flies over the snow. Not just flying though, hunting, as the passengers fire at a husky dog running away. And while that goes on, US Outpost number 31 is going about its daily business, as we see people reading and playing table tennis. Or in MacReady's case, drinking plenty of whiskey while bickering with a chess computer. My room, to six. Checkmate. Bitch. Few fun facts about that chess computer. Firstly, it's the only female presence in the entire film that characters interact with, being played by Carpenter's then-wife, Adrienne Barbeau. But also, the computer did actually cheat. Because if you look at the board before the computer makes its move, the computer's move of Rook to Knight 6 would be this. As you can see, that's not checkmate. That's not even check. So McCready had every right to fry the cheating bitch, giving us a nice glimpse into his character as well. Outside, the dog and chasing helicopter enter the base with everyone outside to see what's going on, just as the helicopter lands and the shooter on foot, with the dog acting affectionate to one of the base members, Bennings. The Norwegians aren't exactly a crack operative team when one of them accidentally blows himself and the helicopter up with a grenade. And if you understood Norwegian, you'd know the shooter isn't just shouting gibberish, but warning them that the dog is just imitating a dog, shouting at them to get away. Since Bennings was shot, the rest of the base crew aren't willing to translate right now, as the commander, Gary, shoots the Norwegian, possibly at the detriment of the base, but that's unknown for now. It's all a great amount of mystery and what the hell at the start. In the aftermath, we see the characters we'll become familiar with. One of the doctors, Copper, patching up Bennings, and the radio operator, Windows, arguing with another doctor, Blair, as the base is now cut off from communications to the outside. Which is an interesting departure from the story, and personally, I like the story's version, because there, communications are fine and there's no problem. So, while dealing with everything that's about to happen, the base still has to act like everything is fine. 
It adds this extra layer of tension and selflessness because they have to force themselves to resist any rescue attempts and deal with the situation alone, rather than the situation being forced upon them. Over the body of the dead Norwegian, the rest of the team discuss what made them go crazy, and it serves to establish the characters, like the militaristic Gary, the hot-headed Childs, Fuchs and Norris. We're learning who these people are now, because whether through the stress of the situation or alien influence, they will all change through the course of the film. Copper appears to tell the others that he wants to go to the Norwegian base, first to see if they require help, and second, figure out just what the hell happened with the helicopter, which seems very minor, but it also shows the selflessness of these guys, and Copper specifically. Now, it's a minor moment, but has significant repercussions later on in the film. So they get McCready, who reluctantly flies the chopper to the Norwegian base, as we see the dog back inside, not really doing much of anything, which, in a way, is more sinister than anything else. It's just watching and waiting. The base is then quiet with people resting, as the dog continues to roam around, until it finds someone who notices it. That's a very interesting moment, because you can certainly argue that one of the base members has been attacked and is now not themselves, which I'm sure was the intention. However, the interesting part is that no one can know who that person was, because the actor playing the shadow was none of the main cast. Which is very clever, because for a movie that's more or less 39 years old, still has this real sense of mystery. The others in the chopper have reached the Norwegian camp. And you can see there's a less than elegant wobbling. Well, that was actually because one of the pilots hired for the film suddenly handed the controls to Kurt Russell. Also, that pilot sounded kind of crazy because he also offered to crash a chopper for Carpenter in exchange for a wad of cash. They find the base smouldering and completely destroyed, and little spoiler here, they used the destroyed American base from the end to create the destroyed Norwegian camp, which is some more movie magic cost cutting, but also has the unintended side effect of subtly foreshadowing our character's fate. Searching through the rubble and aftermath, they begin to find elements of an untold story here, like a bloody axe buried in the wall, or far more gruesomely, the body of a man who has both slit his wrists and nearly decapitated himself by slitting his throat. Now, I got to address the elephant in the room here, because the 2011 remake of The Thing, which was actually a prequel, details what happened at the Norwegian camp. However, because that film has quite a few problems and contradictions, I'm not really willing to investigate that here. So, for the purposes of this review, the prequel doesn't exist. Copper insists on taking any research they can to piece together what happened, including video equipment. And that's when McCready finds a huge block of ice, seeming to have contained something, and it's eerily sarcophagus-like in appearance. Outside the base, they find something dead, mostly burned, but what remains is human-like. But neither men are sure of what they're seeing, and what we can see, it is very fucked up, whatever it is. Which is reflected in all the characters' horrified reactions when they see it. And that's when we witness the body's own horrified expression. Or should I say, expressions, as it has two faces melded together. Who mentioned Hellraiser? Dr. Blair and Copper perform autopsies, first on the Norwegian, who is perfectly fine except for the hole in his skull. However, it's the creature where things get odd, because despite its appearance, it has a normal set of human organs. Elsewhere, the issue with the dog comes to a head as one of the men, Clark, takes it to the kennel, where the rest of the husky dogs are kept, and instantly something is off as the dog slowly enters the kennel and sits in the middle of the room, seemingly losing its dog-like personality. Once the light is off and Clark's gone, the dog makes its move. It changes into some kind of multi-limbed, tentacled monstrosity while spraying the dogs with something I'm sure is horrendous. When Clark returns to investigate the noise, some of the dogs manage to get away and fortunately, he quickly slams the door on the mess of tentacles snaking out for him. That moment always bothered me, since you can see and hear how the thing recoils in pain, which doesn't really make much sense. Because, are we seriously supposed to believe that a creature which tears itself apart limb from limb has a regular pain response like humans have? That seems a little incongruous to how this thing works. 
McCready, who's trying to top up his blood alcohol level, hears the commotion and pulls the fire alarm, as everyone gathers in the kennels to see what the hell's going on, with Mac showing almost precognitive abilities by getting Childs to bring a flamethrower with him. A quick aside, as people question why a science station would need a flamethrower, but it actually makes complete sense. As someone who's been in sub-zero temperatures, I've seen firsthand how the cold seizes up engines and pipes, and you need something like a flamethrower to get things moving again. So it's actually not that ridiculous, really. And back in the kennels, Mac confronts the thing shotgun in hand, and we witness what the dog has become before its immolation, as it gives a hideous unearthly screech while continuing to absorb the dogs, leading to a barrage of gunfire. Child soon shows up, but is understandably taken aback by the giant mound of flesh, before finally torching it just as it attacks. The practical effects for the film were done by Rob Bottin, and I doubt anyone can disagree that for 39-year-old effects, they've held up amazingly well. And I don't need to mention how CGI effects would have become as dated as the abacus within the year. But also, for the dog creature... Stan Winston took over operation in an uncredited role because Rob Bottin was in the hospital due to extreme exhaustion. So that's why the effects are so good. A guy nearly killed himself over them. Blair is given more monstrosities to autopsy, with real animal organs used, hence why all the actors are genuinely disgusted. Well, all except for Wilford Brimley, who's a real rancher and cowboy, so he's used to seeing animal organs. See, what we're talking about here is an organism that imitates other life forms. When this thing attacked our dogs, it tried to digest them, absorb them. Yeah, just that sucking on the end of that pencil, Wolford. I'm sure there's nothing wrong with doing that. I have to wonder if that was an intentional moment to tell us that Blair is infected. But my problem with that is that it's so goddamn obvious, when the rest of the film is far more subtle, so I'm not too sure. Blair explains that the creature was in the process of absorbing and then imitating the dogs in the kennel, and with the surviving dogs, Blair begins to realise the horrifying implications of a creature of imitation, as he questions Clark over his time alone with the dog, and how it was wandering camp all day. The rest of the group are watching the footage the Norwegians recorded, showing how they discovered something in the ice, something bigger than the block of ice they found, using thermite charges to extract it and Mac in the chopper finds the massive hole that was dug, outlining the crashed spacecraft we saw. Going back to the novella for a second, there is no Norwegian camp. It's the US base that finds the crashed saucer. The book does explain why the spacecraft isn't a viable transport for the thing to repair, now it's dug out. It mentions how the thermite charges they used inadvertently reacted with the ship's hull, being made of magnesium, causing the whole thing to go up in smoke. The ship being intact here does undermine that, but it was probably what was intended. Back at the base, Mac tries to explain what he thinks happened, but Childs flat out denies it. Which I think it would have been better to place the scene before Childs napalmed a giant mound of flesh with eyes and teeth. He should really be a bit more open to the possibility of alien life forms after that. And of course, the stoner, Palmer, quotes Chariots of the Gods, which is a book about the hypothesis that aliens built the pyramids. Who mentioned Stargate? And whilst going over the situation, Narls, the cook, comes in to complain about clothes left in the kitchen's trash, seemingly insignificant for now. Later, alone, Blair runs some computer simulations on the creature's cells, confirming that the creature assimilates and imitates. And yes, the fact that it can do that with a single cell is a big problem as Wilford continues to use his sucking pencil. The computer hypothesizes that there's a 70% chance one of the base members is now a creature, and the population of the world could be wiped out in a little over three years. However, that does ignore the idea of resistance. Don't get me wrong, if the thing got into a populated area, it would be disastrous. But if the thing has been identified and fought against in both of the bases, you have to consider that people would notice and fight back. So, there's always chance of a successful resistance. The dead creatures are then moved to a more secure location, as per Blair's instructions. No mention of gloves or full-body hazmat suits, though. And while Mac gets his stuff out of the storeroom, Fuchs asks to speak with him in private, as there's maybe a problem, which we see as the bodies begin to melt. And with Mac and Fuchs, we find out why. Blair, who's now locked himself away, has written that the dead creatures are not actually dead. And the climax of this revelation is when Windows goes back into the storeroom, he finds that the thing has already partially absorbed Bennings, 
telling the others outside, but back in the storeroom, Bennings is gone as he's chased outside, and that's when they see the thing. It's only partially Bennings, once again giving that hideous screech, as Mac burns it alive, and Mac orders everyone to make sure and burn the rest of the bodies. But after that's done, they still have the matter of dealing with Blair, as Mac sees him outside the compound messing with the chopper, sabotaging it. And in the radio room, Blair's gone full crazy, smashing the place up, and ranting and raving with a gun. Now, Blair going crazy and forcing isolation on the men works for the film, but it's one struggle for the base. Blair smashes shit up, they deal with it. However, if they went with the book route, where they force themselves into isolation, you would have seen many more moments like this throughout the film. For example, they would have to keep sending regular reports to keep up the illusion that everything is fine. Or they voluntarily destroy their own vehicles. It just would have added to that theme of self-sacrifice and made it far more potent. Regardless of whether Blair is right to do what he's doing, he's still far too dangerous to be left alone, so the others deal with him swiftly with a table and then punching him out, which calms him down at least. What the hell was that? Why did Fuchs just do a comedy pratfall out of nowhere? Sorry, I just thought that was a bit odd. Blair is locked up in the tool shed for his and everyone else's protection. He admits to Mac that he doesn't know who to trust, but he advises Mac to watch Clark closely, as he's had the most contact with the dog. And I do believe Blair is being sincere here, but I'll be connecting it to a later moment, so just remember that for now. Outside the shed, Mac lays out the situation, that they all might become a thing if they don't act. So Copper suggests a blood serum test. However, this plan is completely scuppered when they discover that the blood has been destroyed. It's incredibly quick, considering that they had only just figured out to test people using that blood. Although personally, I think it's more of a coincidence. The thing would obviously know about itself, so as soon as it saw there was a huge supply of human blood, it took the opportunity to eliminate it as an issue. And considering it can change its size and shape to whatever it wants, whether it was locked doesn't really matter. But it does have the added bonus of increasing the paranoia between the men. Which we see when it's clear that Gary and Copper are the only guys on the base to have access to the keys. Oh, as soon as I'm finished, I return it right away. <laughs> I love that look. It's so over the top. It's such an I accuse you look. The paranoia reaches fever pitch as everyone shouts over each other until Windows finally freaks out and then breaks a cabinet open to get at a gun as Gary holds him at gunpoint. But Mac wisely defuses the situation and Gary acknowledges how he's untrustworthy and hands leadership to someone more level-headed. Norris, I can't see anybody objecting to you. Oh yeah, isn't that the thousand-yard stare of a man ready to take the reins of power? Great call on that one, Gary. Mac decides that he will be de facto leader for this, with everyone reluctantly agreeing, and that night, after the damaged blood packs have been burned, he lays it all out simply. The thing is vulnerable, out in the open. Determined to find out who's who, he first dopes up Copper, Gary and Clark, the most suspicious of the group. And while that happens, Mac records a tape, letting us see into his thought process. Using the clothes that were found by Nars in the kitchen, he hypothesises the thing rips through clothes when it assimilates you. And one other thing of note is he says that nobody trusts anybody and they're all very tired. However, he then goes back and records over that with a simple sign-off. I like to believe that Mac recording over that moment he lost composure and showed slight weakness is him thinking pragmatically. Because if somebody does find the tape, they'll need the confidence to fight this thing if they fail. He's actually thinking about the morale of the people who will continue what started here. Now, that's just my theory, but it would certainly fit with the calm, composed chess player thinking several moves ahead. And judging by the last game he played, if he can't win, nobody wins. Later in the evening, Mac is working with Fuchs to try and figure out a way of detection. And first, there's a really nice split focus shot of the two men. But also, when Mac surprises Fuchs, he grabs a flask, and the actor, Joe Polis, has revealed it contained acid. So even though they're working together, Fuchs is still wary of everyone on the base. Once Mac has gone, the lights in the lab go out, with Fuchs resorting to using a candle. But that's when we see he's not alone, and following the figure outside, he finds something surprising. A torn shirt belonging to MacReady. Back in the rec room, Fuchs is missing after the lights went out for an hour. 
MacReady organises the others to search for him outside, yet bizarrely, Mac asks Blair if he's seen Fuchs, despite being locked up in his shed. Yeah, not sure why that was a smart move. And when questioning Blair, the situation doesn't look good considering he's made a noose, and very clearly states that Fuchs isn't Fuchs. Now, again, this is just my personal interpretation, but I do believe at this point, Blair is no longer human and one of the things, and him saying that Fuchs isn't human is its attempt to sow discord and paranoia in a not very subtle manner. So I say Blair is a thing, as the next time we see Fuchs, he's mysteriously been burnt to a crisp, and Mac wants to investigate his shack because the light has been left on. Which, if you think about it, after Fuchs found Mac's clothes, he went to his shack to check it for more evidence, leaving the light on after having to run from the thing, and somehow ended up burnt to death. So the light being left on isn't that mysterious. But we never do find out what or who killed Fuchs, which always irritated me. But indoors, it's been a good long while since Mac and Knowles left, so Childs resumes leadership duties by barricading the door. That is exactly when Knowles returns, being seen by Norris, who isn't doing so well either, showing signs of severe chest pains, which will come to a head soon. They let Knowles in, who's without MacReady, because Knowles cut him loose, as he also found the torn piece of Mac's clothing. So now, the entire crew no longer trust Mac, just as he returns, probably not in the best of moods, as they refuse to let him in. So he takes matters into his own hands and breaks into the storeroom. Fortunately, the safe storage of high explosives just isn't a priority on this base, so Mac uses a few sticks to keep the rest at bay, harkening back to his battle with the chess computer. Some of the others manage to get in behind Mac, tackling him, but it doesn't work, and that's when Norris's health problems come to a head as he suffers a heart attack, no longer breathing. Copper is freed to try and save Norris, while everyone else keeps a very close eye on MacReady. And if you know this film, you know just how crazy this shit's gonna get shortly, which we get to when Copper uses a defibrillator. Clear! Clear. Ah! Two things I want to mention here. First, it's my opinion that when Norris died, that was the thing taking full control, as it sensed his heart problem and used it to its advantage. And also, the thing growing a mouth was a completely instinctual action because it felt the defibrillator and then acted accordingly to stop the perceived threat. And once the thing has revealed itself accidentally and instinctually, it commences a more deliberate attack, as it grows in mass before Mac wisely tortures it. However, the thing still has a few surprises, as the head of Norris separates from the body, growing legs and eyes, despite already having some, oddly. And after Palmer is the voice of the audience, you gotta be fucking kidding. It's soon destroyed by Mac. So much about the thing creature I love. First of all, although it has a human face, due to limitations in the effects, it means it has this incredibly creepy, uncanny valley look to it. It's very clearly human, but it's also very obviously not human. However, this potential failing in the effects means it's all the better for it and can never really go out of date because not looking human enough works. Also, it should be noted as well that when Rob Bottin first attempted the head separation effect, he used a series of highly flammable and volatile chemicals in the process. So when Carpenter brought a fire bar effect into the scene, the whole thing went up in a ball of flame, like something out of Apocalypse Now forcing Botine to start from scratch. After the excitement of the previous madness, Mac has an idea to discover the thing, but that requires the group being tied, which not everyone is willing to go along with, especially Childs, who tells Mac he'll have to kill him first. But Mac calls his bluff pretty quickly, and as if to prove Mac's point even further, Clark tries to attack him, getting shot in the face for the pleasure. Now, that might make Mac look like a callous murderer, but it puts the situation into full focus. Mac's not a hero, and this isn't a story. This is life and death. Not just for these men, but for the whole planet. And despite the cliché I'm about to drop, Mac is thinking about the greater good. So now everyone is tied up, Mac outlines his plan, using what he saw with Norris, that the thing isn't just a single entity, but every part is an individual creature. He's going to take each of the men's blood and introduce a hot wire to it and see if it reacts. Reaction means infection and another log on the fire. 
The hot wire scene is actually taken directly from the story, except there, there are a lot more people, and about half of them are revealed to be the thing and killed off. The film is a tad more gentle. Also, this scene is what convinced the right people to get this film made, and you can understand why. It's a pitch-perfect mix of tension and paranoia, and it's basically what the entire essence of the movie is about, too. Anyway, let's get on to the test. First, everyone gives a bit of blood, freaking out the squeamish with gratuitous thumb slicing. And then Windows is given the all clear and allowed to use the second flamethrower. Next, Mac tests himself and is cleared. And once both Copper and Clark are cleared, you can see Mac start to doubt his own test. However, next up is Palmer. <laughs> Which is a pretty conclusive test, as the former Palmer begins to transform, while tied to the others, so not the best idea. He soon breaks free and runs amok, as Mac's flamethrower is broken, however when Windows tries, Palmer's head splits open and starts eating him, throwing the body aside, before the thing Palmer is set on fire and then blown up outside. With a completely genuine shock from Kurt Russell, as the explosive was unexpectedly powerful, nearly injuring him. And back inside, the body of Windows starts to transform, but Max swiftly takes care of it. Settling the answer to life's everlasting question. Which is the real winner, Mac or Windows? After the excitement has ended, testing continues, with all the remaining survivors cleared of infection, as Gary gives an appropriate footnote to the proceedings. I know you gentlemen have been through a lot, but when you find the time... I'd rather not spend the rest of this winter tied to this fucking couch! Which nicely broke the tension, if nothing else. However, the ordeal isn't over, as only Blair remains to be tested, and Mac, Knowles and Gary go out to the shed, however when they get there, the door is open and the building empty. Blair has been a thing for a very long time now, so has had time to regroup, as they find loose panels in the floor, leading to a secret passage, finding the thing Blair has been busy building a spacecraft. Which is one of the biggest things that this film, the 1950s film, and the story all align on nicely. However, on a more interesting note, the fact that the creature built a spacecraft, and it's presumably near operational, means it's highly intelligent and capable of rational thought. It's not just an animal working on instinct, which in my opinion makes it far more malevolent now we know it's intelligent. In the tool shed, Noel suddenly sees that possibly Childs has gone outside. Why, they don't know. And that's when the generator blows, and Mac understands what's happening. The creature is planning to freeze itself again and wait for more people to come, so this can happen all over again. And now that the thing has changed the rules, even without a means of escape it can still do so, like with the chess, Mac has only one answer. A bitch. The three agree that their lives are secondary to stopping the thing, so they're going to make sure it can't freeze again. First, by blowing up the ship and the tool shed with it. And then, we see the base, a character in itself throughout the film, get systematically burned and destroyed piece by piece. The generator room is the only place left untouched, as they go down and begin to set charges all around the place, which they do in the boneheaded Scooby-Doo method of splitting up. So the Blair thing is able to take them out one by one. First, by attacking Gary, absorbing him face first, in a clear sign the Thing understands stealth. And while Mac does his charges, Knowles wanders off, never to be seen again. Yeah, seriously, Knowles is there one second and then just gone out of the movie. But the reason for this is because there was originally an effect shot of Knowles being absorbed into the now transformed Blair, but Carpenter decided not to use it because the stop motion just looked incredibly silly so I can kind of understand it. Eventually, Mac realises he's the last man standing and prepares the dynamite plunger, but not before the thing attacks, forcing him to dodge. And once the thing finally reveals itself, McCready delivers the immortal line. Yeah, fuck you two! Presumably destroying the creature for good. And with the threat seemingly eliminated, all Mac can do is sit and watch the place burn, just as Childs returns from who knows where. Both are suspicious of each other, but neither are in any shape to do anything about it, leading to the credits, as we hear... Something still lives. Now that ending is deliberately ambiguous, which I like. It fits with the tone of the film, and it should have stayed that way. Unfortunately, 
Carpenter couldn't leave it alone. Carpenter says the ending is obvious. Mac isn't a thing, whereas Childs is, since Mac is breathing, but Childs isn't. Now, personally, I feel it's just a trick of the light, because Mac is frontlit and Childs is backlit. But also, how the fuck do you account for Bennings then? Clearly a thing and clearly breathing. Now, you might think I'm disrespecting Carpenter and his opinion. After all, it's his movie, he should know. Well, not really. Because the thing video game has McCready survive and Child die of exposure and not a thing. And Carpenter made that piece of shit game canon to this film. So, yeah, he made a great movie, but I do not respect his interpretation at all. Where do I start with summing up this film? After everything is said and done, this film is a masterpiece of horror, and it takes a rightful place in the category of all-time classic films. And if I may go back to the critical response at the time, which I mentioned at the start, I honestly believe the reason why it was so critically panned at the time was because it was so different, so original, and so unlike anything else. So the critics sort of rebelled against it. It went against the status quo, therefore the film's wrong, not the status quo. That's my interpretation anyway. Even though I did excuse the critics, there is one critic I wanted to quote, because there's kicking someone when he's down, and then there's this guy. Because Alan Spencer of Starlog said, An example of the new aesthetic. Atrocity for atrocity's sake. John Carpenter was never meant to direct science fiction horror movies. He's better suited to direct traffic accidents, train wrecks, and public floggings. Damn. Now, I can be harsh sometimes myself too, but damn. But I guess the good part of that review is that history proved the guy dead wrong in the end. And on that note, thank you to Jeff McConnell for requesting this review on Patreon, and thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time.